my pleasure to, inter to introduce you Alexander Kornakov from the University of Helsinki with his uh, second uh, today's keynote address, uh, which we are very excited about. So please take your place and. Thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a great privilege to be here, and I'm very excited uh, about this um, conversation that I hope we'll have. Probably not straightforwardly after what I have to tell you because of the time, because of the time constraints. But uh, still, I hope that this conversation will uh, continue. So um, I, I have a few uh, alerts to share with you before we continue. So first of all. Uh, this talk includes uh, discussion of violence and it can be uh, problematic, disturbing to uh, many people. So if you don't feel comfortable uh, uh, hearing about violence, I, I suggest you have to leave the room uh, right now. Although, uh, uh, to be fully truthful, it's one of my most vegetarian uh, uh, presentations. I will not talk about cannibalism gentle mutilation and a lot of other stuff that I usually talk about. So uh, it also leads to uh, another uh, spoiler alert. I'm a sociologist of law, so I'm not a geographer. And uh, my discussion of some geographical metaphors in this uh, talk will mostly relate to sociological understanding of uh, geography or of spaces. Right, so uh, this is the second thing. And finally, uh, it's uh, pretty much work in progress. Uh, it's a part of, uh, hopefully, my book project. And to be exact, it's chapter four, uh, <laughs> hopefully. So uh, it's, it's still in, in, the very, in the very beginning. And in order to be on time, I probably will uh, mostly read my paper. So let me uh, begin and, and say that uh, uh, the, the, the whole conversation starts somewhere in 1990s in post-Soviet uh, Russia where private space was conceptualized as a sort of uh, shelter uh, from the uh, outside hostilities. However, my current research, it's related to hate crimes and it shows that this shelter turned out to be a place of heated debates that lead to violent assaults and feature most vicious uh, forms of violence, multiple stabbing, torched to death, uh, and even cannibalism. So contrary to usual assumptions, private spaces are violent spaces, just like uh, public spaces are too. Thus, instead of approaching space with the binary logic of public and private, I propose here to study what makes any space a violent space. Uh, so I look at the application of criminal law in Russia in cases that deal with gender and sexuality, and these cases almost always have a spatial dimension that uh, is not so straightforwardly conceptualized by the law as one would think it should have been given the nature of decisions taken in courtrooms. Like the very important decisions like how many years you have to spend in uh, jail, for example, in prison. Uh, some cases could be referred to as domestic violence and others as hate crimes. And domestic violence cases are assumed to take place in private spaces of homes. Uh, as for hate crimes, they're understood as essentially public spectacles. And uh, nonetheless, many of the cases I review question very much these strict dividing lines. Let me provide you with uh, a couple of examples. So the first one, two young lads uh, were hanging around the lake of Staritska in the town of Arekhovazuivo in Moscow region in 2003. They were classmates in college and just drank beer that summer day. It's a very romantic scene I would like you to imagine. An older man approached them and offered a blowjob. One of the guys agreed and disappeared with the older man, while the other guy did not know what the blowjob was. He was a very innocent boy and uh, retreated back to drinking. As he grew bored, he started to search for his mate and uh, eventually discovered him with the older man in bushes having sexual intercourse. Uh, and I quote here, he got scared, packed his things, and left the lake, as his testimony in court specified. Eight years later, 
so in 2011. Uh, the scared guy met his former classmate again near Bar Alaska uh, of their hometown. Two other friends of the perpetrator were the only witnesses of this late night encounter. The perpetrator called his victim names and broke his nose with a punch in his face. On his trial, he acknowledged that he hated homosexuals and was found guilty of a hate crime and uh, sentenced for a year in prison. Here's a different example. Uh, in the beginning of October 2011, police officers from Ariol, a regional capital south from Moscow, found a, a, quote, visibly injured body of an unknown man in a yellow woman's dress and nude-colored tights. The body lied in a ditch located not far from a dam across the Oka River. A year and six months later, Ariol District Court sentenced three men for this crime. In a very long, 44 pages long uh, ruling, the court reviewed contradictory accounts of the events that led to the man's death. Uh, the victim was part of a larger company that gathered in a small one-bedroom apartment uh, to chill out and drink vodka. When two of the defendants arrived to that apartment, seven other people were already there, including the victim, uh, a hostess, and her little baby. Most of the people did not know each other. Uh, there were more people coming and leaving all the time during that wonderful, joyful evening. Although all of them were quite drunk, the new guests brought two more bottles of vodka. Since their arrival, they had felt tension rose between the hostess and the victim. And she called the victim names, a person with non-traditional sexual orientation, requested money from him and constantly bothered him. At a certain point, the hostess took the victim to a bed and, I quote, sat on his face with her genitals, also trying to push her panty into his mouth. He resisted, which was viewed as another uh, proof of his homosexuality. One of the guests stood up for the victim and was locked in a closet only to be taken to a cemetery later on where he dug his own grave and was buried alive in it. He survived and did not press the charges. As the night progressed, the victim was forced to wear that yellow dress and uh, the tights in which the police found him. The three convicted men had fiercely beaten him up with their fists, legs and empty vodka bottles. Blood was all over the place and the man could hardly walk when the drunk company took him to their car and drove away in the direction of the Oka River Dam. Uh, here's the place actually. It's a, a sightseeing place in Areola, very nice and uh, ancient construction. Uh, on arrival, they opened up the boot of the car and took the man out. He started to walk but fell into the closest ditch where he would stay for another week unfound and unrecognized. The criminals took off and headed to the victim's apartment to pick up some of his belongings. They then returned home where one of the defendants engaged in sex with the hostess and the rest of the guests had sex with another woman present there. So there's a lot of gender and sexuality uh, in that case. Uh, this was not a hate crime, uh, according to the judge. In fact, the question of hatred was not even discussed in the courtroom. Although the presented story matched the hate crime narrative in many ways, the crime was just a manslaughter, which is a non-intentional murder of a, of a passionate nature, crime of passion. So there is indeed a lot of passion in this narrative, but what interests me more is the spatial dimension of this crime, and how is it not a hate crime. In both cases, victims were called names, right, referring to their sexual orientation. In both cases, this seemed to be the reason why they were attacked. Uh, what was different were the settings of a crime. One occurred here, right, um, in a presumable public space. By the way, you can easily understand that nothing good can happen uh, near the bar Alaska, right? And, and um, so it was a public space, whereas the other one took place in a private apartment. Uh, nonetheless, the perpetrators in the second case actually covered a significant distance together with the victim. Uh, I reconstructed uh, uh, how could that distance look like in, uh, in, in the Google Maps. 
So they uh, went to the cemetery, they, they went to the dam, they went to the apartment of the victim, and they retreated back to their apartment. So they, they uh, traveled a lot during that night. Uh, the nature, moreover, the nature of the private apartment where they gathered and where the crime commands could hardly be called so private. There was a crowd of people uh, who were coming and going. They all were on the phone inviting new people to come in. Uh, they barely knew each other, if at all. Whereas in the first case, there were very few men, four of them, and they all knew each other, right? So from these narratives, it seems like the spatial character uh, of the crime scene matters uh, for legal qualification of a case when the judge tries to squeeze this large territory into uh, what is called privacy, right? Private space. Crimes of passion, just like domestic violence, uh, belong to this space of privacy, and this space is conceptualized as home. This is where passions are supposed to take place. This is where they sometimes lead to violence. And hate, in contrast, is a public feeling. Yet facts do not support this conceptualization. Hence my aim here is to start laying out a different conceptual understanding of space, one that may help to rethink existent law and bring it closer to materiality of actual spaces. This is very much work in progress, I repeat. So um, I will really appreciate your feedback uh, even uh, later on. Uh, so I look at those criminal uh, uh, law files and violence against LGBT people in Russia, and I regard those incidents of violence under review as hate crimes, uh, although judges do not see them this way. And in this research, my aim was to find out whether the introduction of gay propaganda law that happened in Russia in 2013 influenced somehow the level of uh, violence. So uh, I organized this research. We digged into uh, databases of court decisions in Russia and downloaded more than 3,000 decisions. Uh, 283 of them were first instance court decisions on violence against LGBT people starting from 2010 to 2016 and uh, they concerned 314 victims of violence. Then I just uh, made this simple uh, statistical calculations to uh, kind of prove that the uh, law, the gay propaganda law, uh, somehow influenced the level of violence because violence uh, grew, uh, grew in exactly in, in 2013, right? It started to grow there and by 2015 it actually uh, doubled in comparison to 2012, for example. And uh, however, those were uh, hate crimes as I define them, uh, not the judges on the cases. Hate crime narrative usually consists of three crucial elements. One, the perpetrator refers to the victim with a derogatory term marking uh, a personal trait that the perpetrator doesn't like about the victim. Uh, two, the perpetrator acts upon this indicated prejudice by applying violence to the victim. And three, the whole episode occurs in public. Uh, if the first two elements are of formal nature, they are assumed by criminal law statutes in Russia and elsewhere, the third element is unofficial. Judges all over the world just think that hate crime is a public spectacle. Yet the majority of cases I review occur in what is usually referred as private. This is uh, relevant to um, overwhelming majority of those cases. They could have been official hate crimes, but for this unfortunate spatial arrangement. Not only uh, because of this, but uh, this is a, a big part of the picture. But my question is, how come uh, we are still so invested in the public and private divide, even in such a, a precise and, and important context as criminal law? Wasn't there a decades-long critique of uh, spatial dichotomy uh, that have made it perfectly clear no public and private space is something that actually exists or that can organize our thinking about spaces? Moreover, I can imagine people of the recent past who, who felt public and private spaces in their experiences. They were going to work uh, in a public space and they went home afterwards uh, in a private one. They divided professions along gendered private public spatiality, they saw private companies as independent from public interests. 
but is it still a thing? More and more people now work at home. Gender still organizes uh, people's professional careers, but there is a strong recognition of it as injustice. Uh, corporations are clearly engaged in actually spending uh, public money for their own benefit so that they were saved from economic crisis, right? So why are we still so stuck to the public-private divide, even though it is not part of our experience anymore? How do we overcome it uh, in our thinking to begin with? Sexuality was for many years considered a private matter, and again, uh, uh, although feminists have argued long ago that private is political and therefore public, and although gay liberation movement made visible a variety of sexualities to the public, I can still imagine people who could have ignored it because they had never encountered anything like that in their everyday life. And those days passed though. Let me give you some examples of how the usual cartographic metaphors of space are irrelevant to our everyday sexual interactions. So, there's a, a dating application gay community, some of you may have heard of it, Hornet, a gay version of Tinder, and it's like Lyft to Uber when you think of relations between Hornet and Grindr, right? So, just like many dating applications, it works with geolocation technology, allowing uh, to its users to instantly estimate proximity to their next possible sexual partner. Uh, that was its design and the way many users try to proceed with this application. However, it also reflected current uh, shifts in understanding of spaces. Firstly, again, just like uh, any other dating application, Hornet blurred distinctions between public and private. The Hornet environment suggests that user, users there expose their private sexual desires to the public. Once you are logged in, you assume yourself available to sexual intercourse with most approximate partners. Their proximity may not be the only uh, criteria you apply, although I, as time goes by, it becomes more and more crucial uh, factor. So, but the very fact of logging in is, uh, makes your presumable private sexual desire matter of quite public knowledge. In fact, you may even receive quite intimate private questions from strangers. Are you top or bottom? Yeah, it's about sexuality. What are you up to? Meaning, can we meet for sexual intercourse right now? Can you show me your dick? And this all without even saying hello or anything. Right? So, I, I know this all from uh, sociological interviews I conducted uh, with, uh, with gay people. And uh, even though many users say they use the app for human connection and what they want is communication with other people or feeling of community. The environment itself uh, and the user's actual experiences there suggest this is not the case. The geolocation feature of the application is more public than many users think, if I still continue to use the cartographic metaphors. An informant in one of uh, my studies walks around the city of Petersburg and logs into the Hornet in the city various neighborhoods uh, in order to see whether or not his friends are there and who of them is gay. Uh, he himself is in deep closet. However, the application helps him to remain in the closet at the same time being quite active in various ways out of the closet. I'd, also, uh, I'd go as far as to say that the very notion of closet uh, and gay coming out does not make a lot of sense in his case. While in the, in the app he's open, but outside it he um, claims to be uh, married to a woman. He actually wears a wedding ring to pass as a heterosexual. So is he out or is he closeted? Is the app's environment public or private, given people walking around the city monitoring your uh, sexual availability through building walls. Right? Uh, consider another observation um, from Hornet, and it will deal with this matter. Dating apps are supposed to introduce immediate sexual partners to each other, basing on very simple calculations. So the closer you are to one another, the better chances you have to meet up and engage in whatever you're looking for 
previously and um, mutually agreed upon, I hope. Yet the application creates a space for sexual intercourse without actual spatial proximity too. Since this virtual environment is already energized, some people are looking for sexual intercourse without bodily presence. Uh, some of them immediately send you their dick pics and expect one in return. Some of those dick pics are sent specifically to fish another partner um, or a partner for bodily connection, but many of them are also sent without this purpose in mind. Um, and, and with the only aim to get a digital penis in return, right? So uh, then another picture from a different angle or another body part, a couple of filthy words and that's it, log out, you uh, have what you wanted. This is especially so for long distance relationship. Uh, Hornet shows people's profiles who are thousands of kilometers away, you can explore, uh, as they call it, explore places and uh, who uh, never met, have few chances to meet, or interest even to meet, uh, and, and still who engage in what I uh, call a global circulation of dick pics. <laughs> from Japan to Sweden, from I don't know, Mexico to Portugal, and uh, uh, from whatever locations. So this global circulation of dick pics, in many ways, questions adequacy of standard uh, cartography and especially cartographic metaphors in uh, social science. Hornet becomes an environment without borders or particular spatiality, even though it still has a border of its own. Once you logged out, you find yourself in the misery of maybe private apartment. So in part, these concerns have been addressed by criminal law system. And for example, in heterosexual relations, dick pics are already considered harassment or sexual violence and the person who sends them may be subject to persecution in a few countries. Certainly this is not the only thing we can learn from dick pics. Uh, my question to them relate to more conceptual level. Uh, uh, considering all this experience, why are we still relying on a, on a very inaccurate language of private and public dichotomy? I think the problem is that we lack conceptual language to describe actual situations, despite that the very materiality of spaces give us all the clues uh, about the inadequacy of private and public divide. So post-socialist studies have a long-standing tradition of questioning Western conceptualizations, including those of space. In my previous research, for example, uh, the one where I interviewed the guy walking around the city with Hornet, I encountered a lot of gay and lesbian people saying something like this, like they dislike pub public protests, they don't like uh, pride events, and they, they fiercely argued against pride parades and LGBT rallies in general. This sentiment formulated in these categorical or more subtle ways in other interviews was an expression of the loss of alternative politics rather than opposition to the Pride events as such. As they inform me in the interviews, open street conflict reminds post-Soviet careers about USSR style of politics, where public demands were openly articulated in a form of support for the government. LGBT organizations, paradoxically, are rejected on the basis of being involved in public activism that is seen as an engagement in official politics, so long as the form of street protest suggests it. I think the uh, peculiar feature of Soviet structure of space can explain this situation. Citizens' political intentions belong to the space that is neither public nor private. Uh, let me unpack, unpack this just a little bit. So in 2013, uh, New York-based Russian artist Evgeny Fix published a book entitled Moscow. The book is a collection of photographs uh, of public spaces in the Russian capital, cafes, parks, there are many of them, uh, squares, railway stations, public toilets, and readers are not allowed to see anyone there or happening anything in those places, uh, even though uh, uh, these places were once frequented uh, by, uh, by the invisible citizens of the Soviet Union, what, the, the queers. Under each photograph there was uh, in the book there was a short caption with the dates of the use of, this, of, of the place 
uh, as a significant space of belonging to the subculture. And the dates uh, start from 1920s and they finish in 1980s. Uh, and, and this collection supplies a kind of alternative image of the oppressive regime, uh, the Soviet regime, by depicting the sites of subculture that deemed to have had no uh, space there. So there are more of those pictures. How did those uh, spaces came to be? Uh, so in 2017, Russian monarchy rule was interrupted by the Great Socialist October Revolution, and that began an alternative project of modernity uh, in Russia and other places uh, of the revolution's influence. And this novel path featured a number of differently organized, in comparison to capitalism, social uh, institutions, including speciality and politics. Thus, the state bureaucracy took control of the private premises, including uh, individual houses, in order to uh, lodge other people into, from, them, from then on, common communal apartments. And homosexuality, of course, became observable there, but also something that you cannot talk about. Because in 1934, voluntary male homosexual intercourse was recriminalized, and many other constraints related to sexuality and gender were laid upon by the, by the party, enacting a discursive regime of silencing. Uh, in other words, by the end of the 1930s, the Communist Party controlled both material spaces on the one hand, but also discourse, what you could uh, think and talk about. So they thought, because uh, such spaces as the ones depicted by Evgeny Fix uh, still uh, showed continued survival throughout the uh, all Soviet uh, periods. This suggests that the law and medical persecution against male and female homosexual uh, relations were at least to some extent resisted there. These queer spaces represent an effect of monopolization of material space uh, uh, by, uh, by suggesting uh, emergence of an alternative space within those spaces. Uh, uh, Viktor Varankov and Elena Chikadze, for example, say parallel with the official public sphere, they came into being another public sphere in the USSR. Susan Gall and Gail Klingman applied similar thinking as they offered a purely linguistic analysis of public and private in the post-Soviet Hungary. They recognized that public and private are different in post-socialist countries in comparison to the West. However, they see the difference as simply linguistic contextual. Whereas in the West, they say public and private contextualize politics and labor with the, with the Burgess home as the exem exemplar of privacy and political office as its opposite, in socialist states, this very same dichotomy is reproduced on a different level. For the same reasons as, uh, as I just described for, for the USSR, politics was located in what would be called private in the West. People engaged in political uh, uh, argument, agitation, formation of parties or political action in private because uh, what would be considered public in the West was totally occupied by ceremonies of the Communist Party. So marching on the 1st of May, uh, voting for the only candidate in the ballot and expressing full support for the government were quasi-political ceremonies in the public. Meanwhile, publishing a homemade newspaper critical of the government, some is that, gathering on the kitchen of private departments for political strategizing and organizing at one's home a resistance group against oppression were political actions with real consequences that actually constituted politics, uh, though performed in, in the private. A different approach to spaces would consider not its linguistic or discursive formations, but rather its material properties, including those cemented by law. In her seminal essay on public and private divide, and bottomly, anthropologically studies shopping malls as a space introduced in many towns and cities across the UK by private developers supported and partially financed by uh, public officials. Although malls seize a piece of public land in exchange for the promise to make that land more comfortable and safe for consumers, it's not the only uh, space uh, it's not only the space for consumption. Bottomley argues that a mall is still essentially a private space because of the crucial elements that make a space private. Or to be exact, it's a domesticated public space. She applies three criteria to figure out 
uh, whether space is public or private, the use of space, access to space, and familiarity of people who are in the space. Uh, so it turns out that a mall is a space of limited usage, it's a known place in Auger's terms, designed for a limited set of actions. It, it's also less public than one would expect since it has private owners. Uh, they determine who can get in, obviously groups who are not, well, uh, who are not uh, there for consumption uh, are not welcome. Here's a quote uh, from her work. So, domestification of, of this public space also involves getting to know the people who frequent it. In many senses, as Bottomley insists, a shopping mall is a public space that is home through, uh, that is made home through engaging uh, into interactions with familiar people who share the same stylization of life, the same economic class. Uh, this materiality of space that she analyzes makes perfect sense, however, she remains within the categories of space that still rely on public and private divide uh, as relevant concepts uh, when showing that they are of no relevance. So I offer to take these arguments further in a discussion of spaces from the new materials perspective. This perspective combines linguistic, discursive uh, approaches with those of a more material character. Karen Barrett calls this approach a post-humanist performativity the performativity of the matter. So I take the arguments about the contextual definition uh, of uh, space from the discursive literature. The space is defined from the outside and may change its definition depending on circumstances, the context. I also side with a more materialist reading of spaces when reviewing spatiality through three criteria, access, usage, and familiarity. I want to suggest a way to analyze spaces as contextually assembled material entities, and this will help to define a space through a variation of notes that an assemblage may ground. My final uh, um, part of the, of the presentation for you is a, an empirical part, and uh, let me start here with access. So, as you may recall from the cases above, Private apartments are spaces where many people may come and go. Thus, in, in terms of access, they can also be said to constitute quite an open space, public space in many different um, ways. Furthermore, access to these spaces may be gained through an arrangement that takes place before actually coming to the apartment, like in these cases, for example, when arrangement may be acquired through dating applications or dating websites. What makes a space violent is, however, not the fact that a number of people can get access to it. Rather, the perpetrator's feeling that someone who is present there uh, must not have the access, even if that someone is the owner of that place. Right? So therefore, there is a physical access that is gained or is simply given by the space being open, in fact. But there is also a discursive element to it when someone is denied access because of violating the rule of access uh, or the rules of access by being different. Let me uh, provide you an example from, from, my, from my cases. A man invited another man, previously unknown. They met at a train station uh, in Shimanovsk, in uh, Amur region. And... Um, so he invited his to his apartment to share a few, a few drinks uh, in a company with his wife and another man. The conversation over drinks erupted in violence, and I will quote. So the victim told him that he did not like the female sex in general, and that he had negative feelings toward women. The defendant was apparently hurt by this news and continued to, incorporate the, uh, to interrogate the victim why he had this attitude towards women. The victim explained that he was a person of non-traditional sexual orientation. After these words, the defendant became furious, started to curse and call him names. The defendant asked why the victim did not inform him previously about his non-traditional sexual orientation. They both rose from the table and the defendant started to beat the victim. This story clearly shows how a mundane drinking ceremony evolves into a violent confrontation. So three men and a woman sit at the table face to face and talk candidly about personal issues. Then uh, one of them reveals 
his sexual orientation as a courtesy to the host, following the rules of honesty appropriate to such conversations and answering direct follow-up questions. Instead of receiving the revelation as a sign of trust from a stranger in his apartment, the host interrupts uh, the talk and starts to retrieve the access to the space previously granted. This impossibility to continue the encounter is evident when the defendant asked why the victim did not reveal his sexuality earlier. If he had, they would not have spent any time together because the victim would not have been invited to the apartment at all. And uh, manipulations with uh, the access to a space uh, in this instance are contextual. What makes a space a violent space is redefinition of access rights. That spurs conflict. And this is a fatal conflict in this particular case. But why does it matter uh, for those perpetrators of violence that their victims are gay? This has to do something with uh, the usage of spaces, uh, the second element in the equation. What do people do in these spaces? So, as evidence from my uh, case files, they use these spaces for many different things. They drink alcohol, chill out on the streets, look for human connection, and so on, right? So, uh, a lot of everyday interactions that we all do. However, what all those interactions have in common is that the people there also do their heterosexual masculinity. They do not, uh, they, they do not just drink vodka or gather in small groups or on the streets or conspire to form a vigilante group. They do all this to reassure and confirm that they are man enough. So usage and access work together in uh, this constellation. That's the fact that more people are present than just one or two suggests that the perpetrator's responses to spatial proximity of queerness uh, are controlled or monitored by these other people. If just one is present, the space can hardly become uh, violent, if only suicidal. If there are two people, the space can become sexual more often than violent. Yet when three uh, are there, or more, right, the perpetrators face a choice. React to manifested queerness or signs of queerness in a friendly manner and in a way share that queerness and in their conception also fail their heterosexual masculinity. Or react with violence to disassociate from the presence of queerness and therefore prove their heterosexual masculinity by violence. Consider this example from my database. So it's, uh, it was in 2014, a group of three men decided to celebrate International Women's Day on the 8th of March. Their plan was set in motion as they met at an apartment of one of the men's friends. Uh, two of, of the men had alcohol with them. They wanted the third man to join the company. Eventually, the three men relocated to another apartment and started drinking. As one of the participants record, uh, recalls, I uh, quote, they sat at the table, began to drink alcohol. The defendant and the victim continued to sit at the table together to drink and to chat. They entered into a conversation about women. The victim requested that the defendant congratulate him on the holiday they were celebrating. The defendant was surprised and pointed out that this was a women's holiday. Then the defendant realized that the victim was revealing his non-traditional sexual orientation to him. The defendant began, began persuading the victim that the victim was not right to say this. They argued, but the victim would not agree. Uh, end of quote. So eventually the defendant uh, stabbed um, the victim with the neck uh, in, in the neck with the kitchen knife they had used to prepare the appetizers. The feeling of being monitored and thinking that what is monitored is one's heterosexuality contributes to creation of a space as a violent space. If you recall uh, uh, other examples from the beginning, there were two friends of that man on the street in Alaska bar. Uh, there were many people in, 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 the, uh, in, in the apartment. Uh, so hence, the violent spaces require heterosexual masculine homogeneity, and when this criterion is not met, violence erupts. Now, finally, what about familiarity of the people present in the violent spaces? Uh, so, they're expected not to be strangers, uh, but this is exactly when they realize they are actually strangers to one another. The spaces show their real faces, violent spaces. 
People there are frequently sexual strangers to one another in many different ways. Uh, yet the perpetrators uh, presume familiarity in one crucial characteristic. Sexual desire should confirm to the heterosexual expectation. And uh, many of those stories evolve around getting to know someone more in, uh, in this sense. As soon as someone's different from heterosexuality, sexuality becomes known, the space is filled with tension. I offer to understand familiarity of the people in violent spaces in terms of intimacy. The situations described in all the cases include intimacy as a crucial element. There, people are in an intimate proximity to one another, and this proximity is also a tension that may resolve violently or sexually. Intimacy creates a space of sharing when people engage in frank conversations about sexuality. This is why when confronted, people openly speak up in these situations. Um, you remember the, the uh, uh, International Women's Day uh, case, for example. And this in intimacy may also transform into spatial intimacy. It is quite contextual. Like in this case, the last case I want to show you, uh, the perpetrator changes location of his and his victim's bodies before engaging in violence. First, they sit outside on a bench with some other men. Then, an unknown young man, I quote, approached them, said hello, and informed that they are sitting together with a homosexual, pointing at the victim. The defendant immediately asked the victim whether what was said about him was true. And the victim hung his head and said nothing in response. After that, he asked, the victim to stand up and walk with him behind the garage located several meters away from the bench they were sat, they sat where they sat. When they were behind the garage, he asked again whether or not it was true, but the victim kept silence. Then he asked why the victim did not warn him uh, that he was a homosexual despite their previous close relationship before. And he hit his face and eventually uh, the perpetrator killed the victim. Like frank conversations, most killings require intimacy, proximity of bodies, secrecy of actions, and shameful feeling about what has been done. Uh, so the result of this uh, little reconceptualization is thinking about not private or public spaces, but about violent spaces. And as we see in, in the examples that I provided, in the violent spaces, queerness serves as a ground for barring from the company of men, including actual spatial inclusion. This uh, exclusion this exclusion happens in various forms. It might be spatial, it, it, a person can be taken away from, from a room where people are, or murdered. The, uh, all, all, all this is done in the, uh, in the conditions of intimacy felt by the perpetrators as be betrayed by the victims. In violent spaces, it is the fragility of heterosexual masculinity that discursively arranges the materiality of these spaces. The bare presence of a queer body uh, in that space is perceived as contamination. In the cases I analyze, this um, results in turning spaces into violent spaces when the queer element is being withdrawn from uh, the space to heterosexualize its materiality. No matter whether or not those spaces are private or public, they are violent spaces. And so I offer to engage in a conceptual conversation about spaces by highlighting the spaces' uh, properties without reducing these properties to the uh, public-private divide. Thank you very much. <laughs>